Back in the 90s and early 2000s, when digital cameras were new technology, they often came in some pretty weird shapes. I mentioned before that whenever there's a sea change in a field of consumer technology, manufacturers often decide that it's time to throw out all the old designs and start making stuff that doesn't take any cues from what came before it. And this often results in a lot of very strange looking and behaving devices, but in the end, it's usually a good thing. Take MP3 players, for instance. While they pretty much directly replaced CDs, they did not ape the design of CD players. And I think we're all pretty grateful for that. I mean, there was that one creative jukebox that's pretty clearly meant to look like a disc man, but they only made one of those. And that's a good thing. While there are some people who still appreciate the early, clunky, enormous media players with bizarre interfaces that came before the iPod, most people are pretty happy with where things ended up. Now, usually these big changes in design happen when some element of the technology that everything was built around changes. CD players had to be about this big because CDs are about this big. So everything changed when the CD was no longer part of the equation. Now, it's not always been this way. You could make radical design changes for no reason at all. Uh, Kyocera, for instance, made this guy here, the Samurai, in the late 80s, and this is actually a film camera. But it's pretty much the N64 controller of film cameras. Nobody is gonna figure out how to hold this thing the first time they pick it up. You know how the uh, Nokia N-Gage had a, a side talking where you held the phone like this? Well, this thing, is for side taking. Instead of holding it like this, like you'd expect, you hold it like that, like a taco. Put it up to your eye like that, right? And you've got the shutter button there instead of up here. It's absolutely baffling until somebody shows you how to use it. And there was no real reason for this. Nothing had changed recently. Kyocera just got a bug up their ass and decided to make a bizarre camera. But the thing is, it's still built around the same film that cameras have been taking for decades. So. When you open the back, you see the exact same transport that's in every other camera. You put the film spool in here, it travels past the shutter here, and then it gets taken up on this spool here. So because film cameras were all built around standardized... I forgot that it does that when you close it. Because film cameras are all built around standardized film formats, they had to be basically the same size and shape. So all Kyocera could do here was rotate it 90 degrees, literally. Digital, however, was not constrained in that way. So with early digital cameras, you saw all sorts of weird designs right off the bat. This is a Nikon Coolpix 990 from 2000. It's actually one of the later models in this series. And it looks normal for just a moment until you notice that there's no lens on the front. Where does it take the picture? It takes the picture up here. That's the lens. And that's because you're not really supposed to shoot with it like this. You're supposed to flip half the camera forward. Or, well, you could shoot with it like this. It'll work just fine this way. Or you can point it down or anywhere in between. Or you can point it at yourself. This had a selfie mode 22 years ago. Since the sensor is connected to the rest of the camera with just some wires and there's no film transport to worry about, you can put the sensor anywhere you want. And manufacturers got really enamored with this. So this sort of design showed up everywhere for a while. This Sony camera, for instance, this is a DSC F717 from about 2002. Uh, it's basically the same idea, except instead of the camera being split in half, you've got this elephant trunk that contains a massive super zoom and the whole thing flops up and down. It weighs like a pound and the rest of the camera weighs almost nothing. It's really weird and awkward. You're supposed to use it like this. Okay, that's not really what you do with it. This is actually the digital equivalent of what they used to call a waist level viewfinder, which allows you to hold the camera down here, but still see what you're looking at. Or you can even hold it up here and do the same, which was actually very difficult with film cameras. It's a cool idea, just a really awkward way to implement it. This actually got displaced later on by flip out LCDs like we have now on everything. These let you do the same thing either below or above you. So it's a great idea, just a really awkward way of implementing it, but it's not actually the most awkward way. For instance, we've got this Minolta here, which at first seems very similar uh, to the Nikon. You've got the lens here and you can tilt it forward or back, won't tilt down for some reason, uh, but check this out. Yeah, bet your camera can't do that. The entire sensor and lens assembly comes right off. And this is not just a parlor trick. It's not just for convenient transportation or something. There's an extension cord. Now, 
you can put the camera and the sensor anywhere you want. You can put it under here or up here. You can put it behind something. So this is actually theoretically a practical application. You can actually use this to get pictures you otherwise would never be able to. I mean, it's bizarre, and certainly I would love to do a whole video about it if it was working. Um, unsurprisingly, it's not in the best health, maybe someday. But the point is, it, it was just wild west. All sorts of wacky things were just coming out of the woodwork. All of these camera designs were clearly just fascinated with the idea that the sensor no longer had to be positioned in relation to the rest of the camera the way that film did. Uh, with the exception of digital SLRs, which actually started out looking pretty weird uh, and then ended up looking pretty much identical to their film counterparts even up to the present day, digital still cameras for the most part veered off into the 10th dimension and became their own totally unique thing. Um, take for instance, the Sony Mavica series. Uh, they made a whole ton of these things. They were incredibly popular and they don't look like conventional cameras at all. This thing is not shaped remotely like a film camera. There's no suggestion of an optical viewfinder, not even one of those uh, crappy little uh, token ones they usually include on low-end cameras. The only way you can find your view is by looking at this screen on the back. I mean, they weren't all like this. There were Mavicas that were much more conventional and actually had eyepiece viewfinders, but for the most part, they were designed like this, their own style that didn't look anything at all like film cameras. And why not? These worked really, really well. Unlike some of the weird products in the early days of a lot of consumer technology, like disc-shaped camcorders or you know early media players with bizarre user interfaces, these things were very pleasant and practical to use. That said, these were still constrained by their medium. In much the same way that film cameras had to be the size of film, these had to be the size of a floppy disk since that's what they recorded on. But the floppy disk was pretty much the largest format that digital cameras ever stored pictures on. From here on, it just got smaller and smaller and smaller and never looked back. By the mid 90s, there were tiny hard drives and even smaller flash cards, and that meant digital cameras could be shaped any way you wanted since they inevitably dwarfed their recording medium. That meant it was open season on conventional camera design and manufacturers were out for blood. And so, in 1997, Nikon put out this gadget, the Coolpix 100. It cost about $399 or about $700 USD in today's money and it owes absolutely nothing to conventional camera design. You hold it like this, shutter button is right here, and that's it. Okay, well, there's a little more to it. In fact, there's some real weird stuff it's worth sticking around for, but first, I just got to talk over the camera aspects of it, which are pretty barren. So here's the device. Uh, you've got your taking lens there, that's where the actual sensor is. Then you've got the viewfinder and then a standard electronic xenon flash tube. You've got your shutter button there. Around the back, nothing other than the viewfinder itself and a ready light. Now, the viewfinder is very simple. There's nothing going on in there other than a pair of frame lines that are supposed to show you uh, roughly where the frame will be in normal and macro focus mode they don't work all that well. In this sample shot, I aligned the pole to the left of the frame lines and I don't know what that got me. On the left side, you've got your power switch. Just pull that down to turn it on. Then on the top, uh, you've got LCD with some basic information. Uh, number of shots remaining, current battery level, uh, whether flash or red eye reduction are turned on, and the date. The buttons here let you just uh, you know, turn the flash off or turn on red eye reduction. Uh, you can set a self timer or you can erase pictures uh, which is done blindly since there's no screen, no video output whatsoever. On the right side is a switch uh, for macro mode that's completely mechanical, and I don't think this thing has any focus control at all. In fact, these are all the settings that it has. There's no white balance, no aperture control, no focus. I think this is a fixed lens that's in focus for everything from like a foot away to infinity, and the macro switch just rotates it a tiny bit uh, which adjusts the focus to about five and a half inches. I'll show you some samples of that later. So you can tell this camera really is just for pointing and shooting, no custom settings whatsoever. It does have two different quality settings, normal and fine as usual, and you get 21 and 48 pictures respectively. Here's some comparisons of those. Fine looks fine, I guess. I mean, I'm a little blurry and indistinct and the colors aren't fantastic, but I'm there. You can see who I am. When you zoom in, it does look pretty grody though. Standard, of course, looks a little grodier. I'm blurrier and indistincter. And this is in ideal circumstances. The solid color backdrop makes this much easier to compress than a, a busy background would be. And still it looks pretty rough, but 
What do you expect from 20 kilobytes? This camera, in fact, takes 512 by 480 pixel JPEGs, and they range from 42K in fine mode all the way down to 20K in standard mode. I don't know how much of their distinctively dismal look is due to the sensor, the processing, or the compression, but by all modern standards, this is pretty bad. All the same, in 1997, modern standards were quite a bit different, so let's press on. Here's an outside shot in fine, and then the same one in normal, and if we flip back and forth, you can see there's a noticeable difference, especially if you zoom in where the stop sign actually goes from reasonable to unintelligible. So it doesn't look great in fine, but you'd still want to use fine if you could. So you can see that as a camera, this thing is pretty blah. I'll talk more about the visual quality later. I took some more sample pictures, but I really got it because it's weird. So let's talk about the weird. The shape of the thing is what made me want to get it initially. It's a good shape, very unusual. Not super convenient. Uh, it doesn't have a tripod socket. Uh, you can't stand it up on a desk or anything. I think Nikon actually made a little dock that you set this thing in if you wanted to have it stand up for like self-timer shots, uh, much like the MPEG cam if you watched that video. Um, but frankly, who cares? This thing is really for pointing and shooting. So the form factor is cute, but for that alone, I might not have bought it. I bought it because of the storage medium. Like I said, digital cameras were using flash memory pretty much as soon as it existed, and formats like compact flash go back to like 93, 94, something like that. So by the time consumer digital cameras existed, formats like this were widely available. Uh, the trouble is you had to read it, and computers didn't have built-in card readers at that time, and particularly if you were on a laptop, it could be hard to add one. Imagine if you were a claims adjuster traveling around the country taking pictures of burnt out apartment buildings and you know, crashed planes and whatnot with one of these and then sending them back to corporate with your laptop from a hotel room over dial-up. Not an uncommon thing. I've known people who did just that. Well, you had to haul around a card reader of some kind, but the problem is a lot of laptops didn't have USB. Maybe if you had a brand new one in 97, but if you had one from just a year or two ago, you probably didn't have USB. And serial port memory card readers were few and far between. I've only ever seen one, and it was for Sony Memory Stick. The best way to add a flash reader to your laptop would have been the PC card slot. Now, pretty much all laptops had a PCMCIA or card bus bay, also known as PC card collectively, and they were very capable. It was either an ISA or PCI slot just exposed right out the side of the machine. You could put virtually anything in there. So you could put a little PC card in there that would accept a compact flash or a smart media card. But if you're going that far, why not just take a PC card directly? They made them. It's actually what PC card was invented for. This is a PCMCIA flash card, and you can just put this directly in a device and then put it right into your laptop. And if you watched my video on the MPEG cam from a while back, you may recall that they took double height PC card hard drives. It's actually a little spinning disc in there. It's a 260 meg hard drive. You can just take straight out of the camera and put right into your laptop. Saves a lot of effort. Skip the middleman. So besides the MPEG cam, a lot of really early digital cameras actually did this. This is the Minolta Agfa RD175, and this guy can in fact take a spinning disc, or it could just take a memory card. It's a great idea. You go out, you take your pictures, either as a businessman or some Nat Geo or sports photographer with an incredibly expensive camera, and you want to rush those photos back to the newspaper as quickly as possible, go back to your hotel room, just slam this in the side of your laptop, and away you go. So the Coolpix being just barely usable and compact and running off of AA batteries uh, seems like a match made in heaven for the insurance claims adjuster who I invented a minute ago. The trouble is, where is the media? It doesn't have any ports, any plugs, no card slots. It's not clear how you get the pictures out of it. I've been waiting the whole video to show you this. You know it's going to be wild. I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't. If, if it was going to work any way it ought to, I wouldn't even have bought it. It's going to be wacky, right? Of course it is. To get the photos off the camera, you pinch these two tabs and pull the battery case off to reveal a PC card. The camera is a PC card. Look, it's the same thing. You just put the whole camera into the side of your laptop. Don't believe me? Just like that. This is perfect. This is how everything should be designed. We're, man, we have flown so far from the light. 
We don't do anything this dumb anymore because we are competent and complacent and boring. Everything used to be ridiculous because we thought it had to be, and we produced works of art like this. This, this is great. No, the camera does not work when it's plugged into the laptop. It's a huge shame, but I suspect that's because internally the flash memory is just connected in two directions, one to the camera processor and one to the PC card interface, just in parallel. And if you powered them both up at once, it would just corrupt the memory immediately. Now it works exactly the way you think it would. You just plug into your laptop, booty, every, every laptop that I've had other than this one goes booty. It's, this one is such a disappointment. It only has one PC card bay. I only keep it around because it's small and it's got the best model number, D420, that's the weed number. But you plug it in and it just shows up as a drive. It's just like a USB key and you can just copy your pictures off. It's really fast, uh, maybe because the pictures are very small. Uh, the camera only stores one megabyte, which is pretty tiny even for the era. So, so it doesn't take long to clear it all off of there. I have no idea how this thing works internally. Um, I was thinking about opening it up, but I started taking some screws out and I, I wasn't getting anywhere and I didn't want to break it since it still works. And honestly, it would just be disappointing if it wasn't wired up as barbarian as I guessed. So I'm just gonna choose to keep the mystery. Once you get past this part, the rest of it is all really basic. I mean, this thing is, it's really, Nothing more than those uh, cheap Chinese novelty cameras that used to be all over the place in the 2000s, you know, and like bubble packs hanging at the store for, for like 10, 15 bucks. Uh, it's pretty much just a, a little orb with a, a shutter button and a, a frame counter on it. No preview screen. Uh, you just take pictures and plug it in via USB. We all regarded them as sludge and just threw them away. Nobody even bothered using them. This is functionally pretty much the same thing, but it is higher quality. It's a better built piece of gear. It actually feels pretty good in the hand, and I think I saw PCFR stamped inside, so uh, fire-resistant uh, polycarbonate. It's a pretty good material. That's why it feels good, I think. Uh, it has good weight, especially with the batteries in it. It's vaguely pocket-sized. It's not actually all that small, um, even though it probably could be. I think all the actual camera is up here, but since it's got to have this big uh, simulacrum on here to get into the computer, it ends up not being all that tiny, but it means that it's really comfortable, at least in my hands. I do like the physical ergonomics, I don't like the ergonomics of the shooting process. It doesn't seem to have like a beeper or anything, so when you take a picture, you don't really know when it's done taking the picture. This light on the back blinks for a bit, but it's not clear if that means it's saving or if that means it's still taking the picture. I also wish that it had any kind of preview screen, but for 97, I'm not sure that was common at all, so I can't really hold that against it. And honestly, though I dunked on the compression, the quality of the pictures is not all that bad. Uh, let's go through a few more sample photos and then I'll show you the one interesting flaw that I found in this camera. So I walked around downtown a bit. Here's the Seattle Gridiron building in Pioneer Square, which is rendered reasonably well. The colors are a little desaturated, especially greens, but this wasn't in strong sunlight, which we don't have any of this time of year. You can make out what the place looks like and the dynamic range actually seems pretty good. Here you can see that dynamic range better. The camera clearly exposed for the sky, but you can still make out the ground. It's not just a black rectangle. Notice, however, the atrocious aliasing going on with the power line, which is phasing in and out of existence and really making the bare grid show up. And the cranes themselves don't look too beautiful. Wildlife photography is definitely not in the cards. You're not gonna get much out of the seagull photo other than a nice gradient. In more city shots, however, you can make out more detail than you might expect. Despite the low resolution and the busyness of the image, everything stays distinct and you can actually make out roughly what the cars in the distance look like, although the street signs are unintelligible. The contrast isn't what it could be. This mobile jackhammer is almost lost among the gravel and dirt. However, the close-up and macro photos of it actually work fairly well. If you were trying to document a damaged tread for an incident report, this camera would do the job just fine. And I took these pictures without flash in the failing light, so it seems to work decently well in low light conditions, which can be a real weak point for digital cameras, especially since you don't see a lot of noise. Oh, and uh, there's me taking a heavy equipment selfie. What's up, teens? Although I don't think this is a great choice for art photography, uh, for the simpler scenes that you might see there, it actually does surprisingly well. This is probably the best picture I took thanks to the low contrast and smooth gradients, and I would have put this on my GeoCities site in 1998 and felt pretty good about it. 
This photo of the setting sun is also not half bad. The CCD smear isn't ideal, but the fact that I was able to compose a picture this well speaks to the usability of the viewfinder, and the dynamic range rescued what could have been a black square with a little white dot in the middle. The clouds have texture and the sun has color, so it's not a bad picture, it's just very small. And while it has a lot of compression noise, it doesn't have much sensor noise, which is a lot more distracting in my opinion. In 1998, you could set this as your desktop wallpaper with no shame. Now, I don't have any casual photos to share, what with uh, parties not being particularly in this time of decade, uh, but I do have these pictures from a contemporary magazine review, which suggests that with the flash on, this thing does just fine for documenting office soirees and the like. There's also further evidence that if you hand someone a camera and there's a cat nearby, they will point the camera at the cat. It has always been this way. So for business, casual, and perhaps even artistic use, this camera is certifiably better than absolutely nothing. I mean. I still would have been disappointed with it even having no alternatives. I know this because a few years later, I had a camera that was almost worse than this, and despite having nothing to compare to, I still hated it to absolute death. I, I wish I had had nothing. Sorry, mom and dad, I know you did your best, but that thing was the worst. This thing seems better than average, however, so I have to give it some number of gold stars. Let's say 10. But I did find one serious design flaw, which seems Impossible given how simple this camera is, but I did find one. See, when I received it fresh from the electronic bay, it didn't work, and I wasn't that surprised. Lots of early 90s electronics are dead by now, usually owing to bad capacitors. I really only wanted this as decoration, so that didn't bother me. As, as an artifact, as something to go on a shelf, any function would have been a bonus, but I got to thinking, this is in really good condition. It's clean, it's not been mistreated, and Nikon took their business seriously. If anyone was gonna use good components that would still be working, I figured they would have. So I figured if it's dead, I can't make it any more dead, might as well take a run at it. So I went ahead and opened it up. I figured I'd start with the power supply side since the battery pack separates from the camera. I don't relish the idea of opening up the camera itself. I'd probably never get it back together. The battery pack, however, just has these two screws right here. Pop a couple of tabs, and there's all there is to it. And there really isn't much to it. There's just uh, this tiny PCB that's got very little going on. Um, the hidden side on the back there has the contact for the shutter button, uh, but on this side you've got the wires coming in from the battery pack that land on these two copper pores, uh, and then you've got the pins at the top that go into this pin strip up here that connects back to a mating one on the camera itself. And that's it. The power just comes out of the batteries into these pins, goes to the camera, and that's it. So I started tracing it out, and right away the problem seemed extremely obvious. Uh, here, the ground wire lands on this copper pore here, and it goes straight across and connects to these pins. Checked continuity, and sure enough, that was connected. And then on this side, the positive lead comes in, lands on this copper pore, and it would connect to the pins over here, but there's a break between these two pads. There's no connection between them. There's just a couple of component pads here with a fuse symbol between them, but there's no fuse. So uh, that seems straightforward. No fuse, no connection, no worky. Except that doesn't make any sense because when I first got this thing, there was no solder on these pads. They were clearly untouched. There had never been a fuse here, and if this thing had come from the factory with no fuse, it never would have worked, and it would have been returned for sure. For $400, there's no way they just kept a completely DOA device. So, with no other ideas, I went ahead and unscrewed the board. Well, would you look at that? That right there is a little tiny surface mount fuse, and I checked it with a meter, and sure enough, it's blown. Now this sort of makes sense, but it also sort of doesn't, because this board is two-sided, but I don't understand why. At first I thought, well, maybe it's so they could flip it over if one side gets damaged during manufacturing, but since these little traces aren't here, then they couldn't do that. So I really don't know why they wasted the extra copper on this side. Anyway, that explains the situation. There really is a fuse, it really is blown, and I think it's pretty obvious why it's blown. This is where we get into the design defect here. If you look at this pin strip here where it connects to the body of the camera, it's just exposed. So if you had these two separated and you threw them in a, a purse or something like that, and you had a, a pair of nail clippers or a little screwdriver or a dime or something jangling around in there, it would only take a moment 
just bridging that across these contacts for just a millisecond or two and it would pop that fuse. And I'll bet you that's exactly what happened. It's, it's a weird design decision on Nikon's part given that they clearly were able to recess these pins. This side here on the camera side has a little spring-loaded cover. If they'd put that on this side where there's power when the two devices are disconnected, then it would have protected it. On this side, I'm not really sure what it's protecting. Seems like a bizarre decision. Now, although I don't have the correct fuse to replace this, since I'm confident that it blew just because somebody shorted out these contacts, I went ahead and fixed this, quote unquote, by putting a little piece of wire across here and just soldering it. So it's no longer protected, but I know I'm not gonna do anything that boneheaded. And sure enough, the camera started working, so I think I'm right. I think that's exactly what happened, and I don't really get why Nikon made such a boneheaded design decision. On the other hand, why would someone transport these two pieces disassembled? It's pretty obviously not what you're supposed to do. So maybe it wasn't so much a design oversight as Nikon just having wishful thinking about their customer base. But anyway, that really is the last thing I have to say about this thing. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe so I know you're into this sort of thing and I can make more of it. Uh, remember to turn on notifications if you want to get notified when I put up new videos. Uh, and if you really enjoyed this video, uh, consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks here are doing. It would be particularly useful right now since my new studio is sapping a lot of the money that I would be spending on weird things like this to show to you. So I gotta recoup if I'm gonna keep getting strange gadgets. Of course, I'm grateful to everyone who's supporting me already, uh, without which I could not possibly be doing this. Thank you all so much, and everyone else, thanks for watching.